Welcome. You're dialed into the Acoustics Podcast, connecting you to the newsmakers and innovators that are changing the way the world experiences the art of music and movies. Now on with the show. And good evening. I'm Ian White, Acoustics Editor-in-Chief. Thank you for joining us this evening on our inaugural podcast here. Tonight's topic is going to be something that I think most of our readers and listeners is something that they're very, very engaged in right now. Tonight, we're going to talk about the vinyl revolution. We're almost 10 years in. Where are we? Where are we going? And why has vinyl come back in such a meaningful way? Joining us tonight from the West Coast is Acoustics founder and CEO, Brian Mitchell. Good evening, Brian. Hi, Ian. Joining us from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, is Acoustics Vintage columnist, Eric Pye. Good evening, Eric. Hi, Ian. Nice to see you this evening. Absolutely. Joining us from the Lone Star State is Acoustics Music Editor, Lauren Halliday. Good evening, Lauren. Hey, Ian. It's great to be here. From Western New York, where he's proudly wearing his Buffalo or Four t-shirt this evening, Acoustics Vintage columnist and aka the Budget Audiophiler, Jeremy Sakura. Good evening, Jeremy. Good evening. And finally, this evening, as we begin our first podcast, I want to give a huge shout out to Mitch Anderson, who is the producer of Black Circle Radio, the owner of Black Circle Studios, and the producer for all acoustics.com, YouTube, and podcast programming. So thank you, Mitch, for all of the amazing work you've done already. And we're very grateful to have you behind the glass with every broadcast. I appreciate that, Ian. I'm uh, I'm hoping that you're going to be saying that, uh, you know, six episodes, 60 episodes from now, uh, <laughs> y- sure yet to be seen. Before we get into our group discussion, I just want to throw this out to the entire group who's participating. 2020 was a banner year for record sales in the United States, Europe, and Canada. And what played a big part in that was obviously the COVID pandemic and the fact that hundreds of millions of consumers have been stuck at home. So it really should surprise nobody that in North America, Americans and Canadians purchased more than 22 million EPs and LPs in 2020, which was a 30% increase over 2019. Then, of course, you throw in the fact that CD sales have been going down for the last 10 years, downloads have been cratering, and then obviously we have the 800-pound gorilla in the room, digital music streaming. You know, most people will accept the fact that, you know, vinyl's resurgence, you know, was going to happen at some point because audiophiles have never really let the vinyl torch, you know, burn out. And with so many turntable companies, so many brands involved in the audiophile industry who are making turntables still in 2021, there was no way that vinyl was going to ever really disappear. And for people like myself who, who have been audiophiles since we were little kids, and I've been involved in the audio industry for more than almost 25 years, vinyl has never really disappeared for me. It's always been my preferred format. I've been listening to records since 1975. You know, so for me, vinyl has always been the primary source. Um, I think for me right now, the reason why vinyl has come back in such a meaningful way can really be summed up in the fact that this is a physical thing. And for 99% of the world, things like records, books, CDs are physical, tangible pieces of art that you own. And now that we live in the digital world, where as much as we enjoy listening to music on Spotify and Koba's and Tidal, at the end of the day, you don't own any of that music. So when you go to bed at night and you turn off your stream from any one of those streaming channels, you're essentially a renter. You pay your $15 to $20 every month to those streaming services, and you could, after five years, have amassed five to 10,000 albums on your favorites list. But at the end of the day, if any of those streaming platforms go belly up, you've lost all your music. So I think for a lot of people, especially millennials, you know, who really grew up in the iPod and iTunes generation, the record is almost the first piece of real music they've been able to own for themselves. And I think that has driven a lot of the vinyl sales just for the fact that people like ownership. The same way people like walking into Barnes & Noble and still buying a physical book going into a record store and buying a physical piece of music that you actually own for life has great meaning for people. Eric, what do you think? Well, yeah, uh, I would agree. I think uh, a lot of people our age uh, would be like that. For myself, I I gave up on vinyl 
back in the early 90s when I went overseas. I sold all my records, sold all my audio. I was going away. I didn't have the chance to carry a lot of stuff with me. Um, and so I've been digital from 91, 92 until just a little over two years ago when I bought my first record and turntable and got back into it. Um, I think for a lot of people in their 50s and 60s, yeah, you're right. They, they probably never gave up on vinyl. Um, certainly on some of the Facebook groups I'm a member of, uh, you know, these people going on about all oh, the music of the 60s and 70s, that's where it's at, man. And uh, anything after that doesn't count. Um, I think the resurgence of vinyl, I think a lot of that is probably on the millennials, because if you're going to have an increase over people that, you know, were buying it all along, the older folks, uh, that's where it's all coming from. And I think in, in terms of the millennials, a lot of it, uh, and, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of millennials, my, my day job, I, I, I work as a career coach. Uh, and I see this kind of, uh, this interest in tradition, this interest in nostalgia, this interest in, in real things, tangible things, and in craft. And, you know, you see a lot of the, uh, the records that are popular these days, you know, they're, they're remasters, they're audiophile pressings, they have this sense of craft to them. Um, and, and you can see it in all kinds of things, you know, like the interest in straight razors and going to barbers and craft beer and cocktails and, you know, fountain pens and journaling and all those kinds of things. Uh, these are things that we kind of gave up with the digital age. And now there's this kind of desire to go back to something more analog. Um, the other thing that I see is, uh, yeah, and you hear it all the time, you know, people talk about how important it is, you know, don't buy things, buy experiences. Um, vinyl is a thing and it's an experience. You know, uh, Ian, you and I have talked about the fact that, you know, there's this whole kind of thing that happens when you put on a record, the whole thing of taking it out of the sleeve, putting it on the on the platter, you know, hitting start sitting down with the cover, reading the lyrics, reading the story of the album and all those kinds of things. And um, I think that has a real uh, power uh, above and beyond, you know, a digital stream where it's just like you chose a playlist and you don't really need to concentrate on it. Um, so I think those are a couple of reasons why I see it. How about you, Lauren? What I've been thinking about really ties into a lot of what Ian said. So I've been thinking about my own journey with vinyl and kind of the timing of it and something that i didn't realize at the time but i can think back now is that when i really started buying vinyl was right kind of at the same time that streaming started because you know, i started out buying cds in the late 90s early 2000s then once um you know uh iTunes came out and iPods and everything. Then I started spending all my money on buying digital albums. And then once streaming came around, Spotify, you know, I think I first joined Spotify in 2012, somewhere around there when I was in college. And it was at that same time was when I started getting into vinyl. And as someone who spent, you know, pretty much all of my, you know, disposable income on either, you know, concert tickets or music, you know, once I was no longer buying digital albums anymore and was just paying, you know, that 15, 20 a month that Ian mentioned for streaming services, it's kind of like, where is that, you know, how am I supporting artists now? Like, where am I going to be spending that money? And vinyl was just sort of a logical progression, I think, that evolution of being a music fan and where do my dollars go? And so I started buying vinyl then and, um, you know, of course, that has continued to grow and grow and grow over the last 10 years. And I think what's really um, tied into that as well is just at the same time, the expansion of social media. And because vinyl is such a tactile visual product, and we are increasingly, you know, our internet lives are intertwined in these very visual experiences and apps like Instagram and TikTok, you know, I think it ties together and meshes really well. People are sharing their lives online. They're sharing photos online. And I think, you know, for those of us who are huge music fans, our collections are sort of an extension of our personality and of ourselves and something that you know, is very personal and intimate to us. And when we're sharing that online, um, you know, sharing that through vinyl, I think, that's just kind of helped it explode in a way because people have really gravitated toward, you know, expressing themselves in that way of sharing their record collections. How about you, Jeremy? 
I started in vinyl when I was young and I, I had a paper out and I remember talking my parents into taking me to Kmart and Kmart had a top 10 section of 45s. And I remember I left with easily five to 10 every single week. They would update it weekly. And I had a massive 45 collection of singles. When CDs came out, I gave them all away, gave the entire stack away. So that was when my vinyl journey started. And that's when it paused. Come lately, my neighbor gave me, gifted me a turntable and, and we said, well, let's, let's buy a few records. And then I started to buy some of the records I used to have. I started to get some of the ones that I wish I had. And I also started to pick certain records out and I really didn't know why. And when I read Lauren's article about it and she spoke to the engineers and the pressing and all of the business and the skill that goes into these, I never thought about that. When I bought CDs, you literally had a CD or a live version. You had the studio version or you had the live version. Those were your choices. When it comes to vinyl, it opens it absolutely right up. There's different pressings, there's different remasterings, there's different limited editions and, and even adding colors, which, which, which I hate to say, I absolutely love that does it. And now my family's into it. Both of my kids have their own turntable. And when we say you want to go to the record store, everyone hops in the car and they can go, they can find a used one for seven bucks. My wife can find another Pink Floyd one that she's never seen before. Cause they're keep, they keep on reissuing more and more. Um, and the pressings are all different. The dates are different. The pressings are different. It's interesting. There's an element to a hunt to it. And we'll actually put the, the album down and listen to it end to end, play it through the way the artist intended it to be. I've not done that with streaming as you play a song and then you move on to the next song and you move on. This has all kind of happened accidentally. And one thing I do know is a lot of the music that I loved growing up, they only released it on CDs. And now they're starting to reissue a lot of these albums and I'm first in line. So I'm seeing these come out in record store days. The lines are getting longer and longer. Um, the record stores are, they're, they're more and more packed. It's been fantastic to, to rejoin this and there, there hasn't been a better time. I think that's awesome where you were bringing up your kids, um, where the, that intimacy that's involved, um, with that experience and that, that sharing that, that takes place. Right. Um, like for example, you know, with this resurgence, what makes this sustainable? How does this, uh, how does this vinyl resurgence not be a resurgence anymore? I, I really wish the industry would just drop that word and just call it what it is. It's, it's just vinyl. It's not a vinyl resurgence. It's just like a CD. It's just like an MP3. It's just like whatever. It, it's just here. It's and and like one of the things about sustainability and stuff uh, that I tend to think about within this topic, what more proof do you need that vinyl is sustainable? Like, is anyone pulling out their wax cylinder archives like to have a conversation about this stuff? No, it's not happening. Um, this is the vinyl medium is the reason for the resurgence of the music industry uh, is kind of how I see it. Lauren, you, you were you know saying, uh, speaking about social media and Eric, um, you were speaking on also like through, I didn't know, which is really sweet to find out uh, in this episode, how you're a career coach, because I, when you were speaking, I was hearing like an education uh, standpoint where you're reading the liner notes, who's the author, like what are you learning from this record? Uh, and that made a lot of sense. And then Jeremy, like with you, I got two boys, um, here and like the most used turntable or arguably device uh, for a, a family piece uh, in our house is the GE Trimline 500 like suitcase turntable uh, that's in our kitchen and it's on a counter in our kitchen and then every single meal like you got to listen to the whole side and everyone gets it like it gets a turn it becomes a whole thing is it muppets or is it sesame street tonight or is it coco taylor or or is it gentle giant that type of of thing is really uh special to me where the sustainability is just built into human experience and that's either shared at home or shared online or shared through the classroom um or, or as a gift handing a record forward you know is even another example 
another another thing I did want to share quick about like my thoughts on that sustainability thing. Artists want to get paid. The status quo of the of the digital streaming era, uh, creatives and artists and touring uh, bands and record labels, they're not going to stand for making this stuff much longer. I mean, let's be real. People want to be connected to the artist and the artist wants to make money. Consumers and people that listen to music, it feels good. This I'm speaking for myself, no one else. It feels good knowing that the purchase of the vinyl record that I can hold in my hand then equates to actual dollars in the artist's hands as well. Uh, and so I think that there's that interplay there, which is, again, a human experience, um, that digital divides. Um, and so that's where I kind of feel that the sustainability in the medium is just built into uh, humans being who we are and wanting to support one another. Algorithms don't tend to do that all that often. Brian, you've been... We we said it on on Black Circle Radio, and uh, you're a veteran man. I mean, uh, being online and then talking now about vinyl on the on this platform, like I I'm insanely intrigued to know um, what your thoughts are. Seeing all the shifts that have occurred within the industry, specifically surrounding vinyl. Like you said, the resurgence is not the right word that we want to be using. It's just vinyl playback and it's been that way for a very long time um but i guess what i i kind of see it as as a search for meaning in a way where you're more connected to the music vinyl gives you that ritual that you need to go through every time you play a record um no other format does that um streaming is relatively meaningless um it's just so uh, it's so available that somehow it doesn't have the same meaning and feeling when you're just pressing play on an app versus going through the ritual of what you have to do to get a record to play back. And I think that's part of this added meaning. And then when you add in the fact that everyone can't have a record, there's only going to be a limited number made that scarcity adds to the perceived value of if I get it, someone else can't have it, which in streaming is the exact opposite. Everybody can have it. And somehow that makes what you have a little less meaningful and a little less valuable. So when you, when you combine those two aspects, meaning and scarcity, that's where and, and it's interesting, I'm not even talking about the sound quality. Like that, almost nobody brought up, Ian brought up in the beginning that sound quality matters. And to a certain degree, if you put together the right system, which 99% of people outside of the audiophile world are probably not doing, they're probably getting an equivalent experience as streaming might offer but it's the ritual of it and it's the connectedness it's the feeling it's all of that together that makes it um kind of gives it that intangible feeling and i think that's part of it millennials have never experienced that before they grew up in a streaming download type of era so this is kind of something that they can try for the first time. They almost missed CDs, if you think about it. Right. Um, they got to skip over CDs and go right to downloads and right to streaming. So this is a chance to kind of try something out new that they've never tried before. And I do agree with Eric going back to the beginning that, that the millennials are the resurgence, although we don't like that word, <laughs> the reinvigoration of vinyl. It's not the old people have discovered, oh, I need more vinyl. I need more record players. Um, but maybe that's part of it. But that's kind of my my take on it. I'll kind of pass it back to Ian, who's kind of digested all this. And actually, I want to hit on a number of points that everyone made. And actually, uh, I want to go to Lauren first, because Lauren hit on something actually that is really, really important 
that I think is going to be even more important as we come out of COVID. So for the last 12 months, there has been no live music. And as Mitch sort of pointed out, one of the reasons why musicians hate streaming so much is the fact that they basically make no money from it. And when you lob off the top, you know, literally the top 1% of musicians who are very successful, so the Drakes and Beyonce's and Jay-Z's, the Rolling Stones, you know, um, I guess Miley Cyrus, because she does fairly well in the streaming world. Regular artists are not making any real meaningful income from Spotify, Cobas, or Tidal. I don't care what they claim. I mean, Apple last week put in a whole article how they're paying artists like at least two or three times what anyone makes off a Spotify stream. But at the end of the day, unless you're a really big star and someone's, you know, streaming your song or album millions and millions of times every single day, you're not making real money from this. As we come out of COVID and we start going back into live music again, I mean, I, I have a couple of concerns that I'll get to, but Lauren touched on the fact that because of COVID, artists have had to use social media to sort of interact with their fans in a way that we have never seen before. Because, I mean, I have to say, like, I mean, just as an example, um, I happen to love Jason Isbell. I I, I love his music. He's an an amazing songwriter. I happen to relate to a number of his songs. Jason Isbell is so active on social media. I mean, I've had conversations with the guy on Twitter. That wasn't happening before COVID. I mean, I know a lot of them have been on Instagram and Facebook and other platforms for a couple of years. But COVID forced even the biggest names in music to actually get off their high horse and actually speak to their fans. They had to actually say, look, I'm not touring for the next 12 months or maybe the next two years. And, you know, when you think about how much money artists make from selling of t-shirts and memory, other memorabilia, you buy at a live show. And the fact that all of that disappeared records were their only source of income because they sure as hell wasn't made. They weren't making it from streaming and like I know people can't see this, but like this, this the the new Lana Del Rey record, it's thirty four bucks. I mean, you know, like, and I think that's another issue that we're going to have to talk about: is the pricing of vinyl sustainable? I mean, will millennials continue to pay twenty, twenty five, thirty, forty, fifty? You know, and audiophiles will pay even more. Will consumers continue to pay this much money for a single record? I think that's a whole other topic. But, uh, but yeah, so Lauren's, t- Lauren's comment about social media, I think, is huge. I think that has driven a lot of this. And, and then, Brian, just quickly to your thing, music has to have some kind of intrinsic value. You know, I think for all of us, you know, we, we wouldn't write about music and hi-fi and movies if we didn't really care about this on a very passionate level. And I think for most people, music is like a, is one of the forms of art that really resonates with them. And I think a lot of that explains why a lot of people have gone back to older music, like as Eric mentioned, why people are buying Bob Dylan records, why they're they're buying Beatles records still or buying Pink Floyd. Um, you know, that type of music is resonating with a younger audience. And I think a lot of that is pushing a lot of these records, you know, in terms of in terms of sales. Guys, what do you think? I totally agree. I've um, just partaken in some really cool things in the last year. Like you mentioned conversations like One that comes to mind, um, one of my favorite guitarists, Julian Lodge, a great jazz guitarist, he's done a bunch of really cool online classes um, and just kind of opened it up, you know, for people to join, to hear him talk about his process, writing music, how he practices, how he, you know, writes with other people, all that kind of stuff, takes questions from the audience. You know, those are opportunities that I don't think we would have ever anticipated having before COVID. And they're things that I really hope will stick around after. And I'll be really curious to see if these artists keep engaging with fans in that way, because I think it's something that's been overwhelmingly positive and well-received by everyone. Like every time I see one of these kind of things pop up, I'm like, wow, this is so cool. I can pay 15 bucks and I can sit with Chris Thiele for an hour and a half. He's one of my favorite musicians. And, you know, just get to find out all about the inner workings of how he creates just something that we never would have gotten in another scenario. But I think it's a, like you mentioned, a source of revenue that everyone realized that they needed to come up with. And I think has been pretty successful and I can see it, um, you know, continuing into the future, but also what you said about 
the support aspect of vinyl. Like, I think that that is huge in terms of also, like Mitch said, the sustainability and just as an intrinsic part of the appeal of vinyl, um, knowing that when you are buying that record, you are supporting the artist. Cause like we've talked about people who are super passionate about music are equally as passionate about supporting the people behind the music. And so, you know, when I talked about where's my money going to go, like that's the underlying sentiment of what I meant. You know, I want to be supporting the artists with the money I'm spending on music. And so if I'm not spending that money on streaming, which like we talked about with millennials kind of grew up in a generation of, you didn't have to pay to get your music anymore. You know, we all had to pay to get our music growing up. And then suddenly music was free for the most part. So if you want to support artists, you know that by buying vinyl, that's how you're going to do it. And so I think that is what will definitely keep it going for the long run. Just to quickly continue on with what Lauren said, um, I took to social media more and more over the um, COVID time. And I remember Ron Hawkins from Lowest to the Low massively popular Toronto artist. Um, he, he played a free show every Tuesday. And I remember my friends from college all dialing in, commenting, and seeing that eight o'clock show every Tuesday. To continue on, just the interaction we had, um, my son's favorite artist, uh, Hazel English, I sent her a DM um, to Instagram and she replied back with a video wishing my son happy birthday. So I have never had that level of interaction with the artists that social media has brought in the Instagram account that I have, which is, which is the only one that I'm really active with. Um, I have 20,000 friends that think the exact same thing. Every single one of them has a turntable. Every single one of them loves vinyl um, and they are continuing to do it. Um, just this weekend, I, I installed the friends system. We retired a Sonos and he has a 1975 Harman Kardon. So, um, and a techniques turntable, um, his family's going, going to grow with that. They have two young sons. So it's been really incredible just sharing all of this, sharing it daily, have people ask questions and having me be able to ask questions. I've asked Eric tons of questions, Eric, tell me about that turntable. Why do you have it? Why do you like it? So Eric and I have gone back and forth and we've met some incredible people and shared some incredible knowledge. The people in this community are just fantastic. Yeah, I would, I would jump on that too. You know, um, on my Instagram, uh, audio love YYC, um, I'm getting close to 20 K there, uh, Mr. King of vintage in Buffalo. Uh, so catching up on you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've met people in Calgary who, I, I mean, one of the guys who I met on Instagram through vinyl, you know, we were each posting records and that kind of stuff. And then we got into talking cause we liked similar music. Uh, one guy, um, sold me his speakers. And he built me my record cabinet and he built me my record shelves. And that's a relationship that I would never have developed without that. Uh, but I've also, I would mirror what, uh, what Lauren said about uh, being able to interact with artists. Um, you know, I post a picture of Katie Lang album and she's also from Calgary. And like 30 minutes later, she's sending me a text message saying, Hey, thanks for posting my record and how's things going in COVID and all that kind of stuff. Wow. Um, wow, wow, wow. Ron Carter drops by, he's a, a jazz bassist. He drops my, by my account every now and then, and, you know, makes a comment or likes one of my pictures, uh, particularly if it's an album that he played on. Uh, there's a Turkish drummer named Ferret Odman. I don't know yep. if anybody's heard of him. Yep. Uh, I bought one of his records and I posted it. And a couple of days later, I had a comment from him saying, how do you like my record? I'm glad that you posted it. Uh, and then that drove me to buy a second of his records. Um, cause now I felt like a connection with the guy bought the record. And then a couple of days later, he's contacting me saying, Hey, you don't have this record. Would you like autograph copy? I'm like, sure. Yeah. So I got a autograph ro uh, record from him. Uh, and there, there's all kinds of musicians where that's happening. Um, so it's the musicians, it's the vinyl lovers, it's the vintage audio lovers, uh, 
developing relationships, but it all comes back to, I like this record, you like that record, we have a conversation about something that you posted. Just a really, really cool thing. Yeah, and actually, I think one topic we haven't got into in regard to vinyl has been the record store. And, you know, and I think that, you know, for me, because I mean, I mean, I'm the old man in the group. Um, I mean, I grew up with Sam, the record man in Toronto. Me too. And, and, yeah. so, and Sam, the record man became a national chain in Canada. Uh, but for me growing up in Toronto, before I moved to the U S um, as a teenager, Sam, the record man was like the equivalent of like tower records in New York city. And, you know, as a kid, I used to skip school and I'm sure my parents are going to love to hear this. I used to skip school when I was like in the fifth or sixth grade, mom. And I would take the subway, the TTC down to the corner of Young and Dundas in Toronto. And I would walk into San the Record Man and there would be hundreds of people. Like, like it was like, it, it was like th th that hasn't happened in any, you know, any industry for a long time other than maybe Target on Black Friday. And I, I would walk into Sam the Record Man in Toronto, and there were tens of thousands of records and CDs and cassettes. And as a kid growing up, I didn't even know where to start. But, but the cool thing was the fact that you met people. You know, because I, I think that, that, that was the biggest loss when vinyl fell off the cliff when CDs were introduced. That record stores and music stores in general were part of small towns. They were part of big cities. I mean, because obviously Toronto is a massive city. Um, you know, and I, it's, it's funny. I always like when, I, when I, I see on um, Jeremy's Instagram feed, you know, he's always, you know, patronizing, you know, these couple of record stores in Buffalo. And I think, you know, we've all grown up in very different parts of North America. And, and in Eric's case, he grew up overseas as well. And I've lived, I lived overseas a little bit in my life. But North America, like record stores have always been a thing. And I think when they disappeared for that decade plus, it was a huge deficit for people who were really passionate about music. And I also think that's why, you know, the audiophile world had a really hard time convincing the next generation as to the value of better sound quality. Because if you put no value in music and you put no value in community, I mean, why the hell do you need a good stereo? I mean, you might as well just buy a freaking iPad, uh, iPod, you know, and my only concern with vinyl going forward, and I think record stores are starting to do this as they come out of COVID. Obviously, the rules were crazy everywhere. I mean, my records, my record store in Asbury Park, New Jersey, you would think Asbury Park, you know, where Bruce Springsteen, you know, met Clarence Clements and, and little Steven and a lot of great musicians have passed through in the last century. My record store went bankrupt. During COVID, how does a record store go bankrupt at a time when vinyl is selling out everywhere? I think record stores have to evolve. That, that's my big concern for the future in terms of record stores. Because record store day only really happens once a year. I think record stores have to become almost like a focal point in their community that includes records, books, hi-fi, whether it's vintage or used. And I think they also have to become almost like a, a place where you can go to listen to live music, because quite frankly, if you're not engaging with the mu with the artists and the music that you enjoy, why the hell do you need a good stereo to begin with? And man, you know? uh, like uh, like on that real quick, when you're talking about the record store and these these stores going you know bankrupt or out of business or uh, whatever it may be, um, the the fact that that's happening, I can't help but. Um, but think about words like trust and um, vulnerability um, and, uh, and then mental health. The community aspect of as an individual thinking about like my sons, thinking about my friends, people that hit me up about questions and, and who I hit up for questions. Um, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm fully transparent about the fact that, you know, that like uh, my mental health on my program with bipolar disorder, with ADHD, with all these things is a big impact on me. And music is one of the mediums that is, uh, it is the medium for me that helps with that. But through that process, um, it, it, you, people need people uh, to trust for, well, I'm in this mood right now. Hey, record store owner. Lauren, you know, you know, like, like I need help. Like this is how I'm feeling right now. What record do you recommend that that doesn't happen um, inside of 
streaming stuff uh, with moods and things, it's, it, it, it's not the same thing. Um, and that's why I kind of think that this is really here to stay as it has stayed <laughs> since what, the 40s, the 30s? Um, it, it's not going anywhere uh, because we as people need it uh, for multiple different reasons. And, uh, and to me, that's, that's really important. So I, I was really happy that, um, to hear you say community and, and to have this conversation kind of go from this overarching, like top down model of, uh, essentially like artist celebrity, uh, engaged with social media interaction. And then this conversation naturally, uh, come down to one-on-one -on -one interaction with the record, the physical record store that's in your town where you can talk to the person that owns it. Um, because that, that everyone, ev everyone needs someone for advice, uh, or, or for <laughs> a musical, a musical therapy session. It's an interaction process and it's, uh, it's the desire internally for me to, to feel good. I want to feel good. And this medium helps me do that. It helps me achieve that. It's whether no matter how small or large, this medium helps me do it. Um, and so that is that's just something that's near and dear, and it'll never leave. I'm not speaking for anyone else, but like I don't, I, it's never gonna leave me. Um, and I'm not unique. So, like, <laughs> I don't think it's gonna leave many people. <laughs> You are no. you you are unique. But can I jump on? I, I want to jump on the record store thing too, because. Like in high school, I lived in, in Oakville, which was uh, a little ways out of Toronto, as Ian probably knows. Um, and so I got to go to Sam the Record Man maybe once a month, once every couple of months, because I didn't go into Toronto that often. But there was a local music world that I went into every day after school at Hopedale Mall in Oakville on my way home. And I would hang out there for an hour chatting with the guys who worked there. And oh, shit, I bought tons of records there. Um, and that was something that I missed when I wasn't in the vinyl realm anymore, you know. Um, and now that I've gotten back into it, I've gotten to know the owners of three or four different stores here in Calgary to the point where, you know, um, I'll see something on Instagram that they post or I'll see something on Facebook that they post and I'll message them and say, hey, can you put that aside for me? I want it. And they do that. And a couple of them have gotten to know my musical taste so well that they actually will put stuff aside for me without me asking. And the next time I go in, they'll say, oh, Eric, I put these aside for you. You know, if you don't want them, that's fine. I'll put them out on the racks. But if you do, they're yours. Oh, and I'll give you 10% off or whatever, just because you're a regular customer. Um, and so that whole I issue of, yeah, relationships that you develop through music and particularly through vinyl um, is is pretty amazing. One of the local record stores in Buffalo, um, we skipped school and we saw the bare naked ladies play for about 18 people in a record store. They played acoustic and they hung out for another hour. They signed records. We got to talk to them and there were maybe a dozen of us. No way. And that was because of a record store. When was that, man? 92. That's so yeah. cool. Still have the CD, still have it signed. Um, Stephen Page even put his little goatee on because <laughs> when, when Gordon came out, he was cleanly shaved. Poor Stephen Page. <laughs> That's all yeah. I got to say. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so actually, if I'm, I'm going to be pompous for one second, Mitch. So maybe, maybe it's a sign of my age, you know, because I, I mean, I just turned, I mean, I basically went, I turned. I was 49 before COVID, and now I'm 51, which is really kind of scary. I, I, I have always believed that you know the type of media that we consume kind of is a good barometer as to you know the level of society, and and and, and this is not a judgment on any type of music that people listen to, you know, because I, I listen to everything. I mean, I mean, I'm just as comfortable listening to the Beastie Boys and Cool Mo D to Rush to Beethoven to to. Um, uh, Miles Davis. You're genre fluid, baby. Yeah, totally, totally genre fluid. Uh, but I will say that I do believe that because of you know MTV and the way that music became a commodity over the last thirty to forty years, when something becomes a commodity, I think it loses its value, and, and I think that creates a bit of a dumbing down of society. 
And, and one of the things that I like so much about the fact that vinyl has come back is that it, it's not just that, you know, I mean, like, I mean, I, I like Lana, I like Lana Del Rey. I mean, I like her music. I, I kind of like, you know, the things that she sings about because I kind of understand where she's going with it. But in the same vein, I would much rather listen, you know, to Don Cherry. And I mean, cause I, and I'm a huge jazz person and I guess it makes me feel slightly hopeful that I see like 20 year olds buying jazz records in 2021. And cause like jazz became like something that only that audiophile nerds like myself were buying for the last 20 years. I mean, cause who needed 19 copies of miles day, a kind of blue. And, 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 and the truth is, is that the fact that, I mean, actually I'll tell you something like Lauren, I look at a lot of the records that you post on social media. So Lauren and I have very similar musical tastes. We both love the blues, blues country, and we definitely like jazz. So to see someone who's younger than me and Lauren get so engaged in jazz and blues, it's kind of like, thank God, like, thank God that finally, because you know something, I don't know if that would have happened. Well, I can tell you it wouldn't have because I've been a blues fan since I was in college, but jazz was a genre that I never listened to before I got into vinyl and, you know, it just wasn't something that I had ever really dug into. But once I got clicked in with the Instagram vinyl community and saw all the cool jazz records that were being shared by people, I was like, Hey, I need to check this out. Like these albums sound really cool. And, you know, just started out with some of, you know, the classics from Miles Davis, John Coltrane, et cetera. And have just, you know, over the past five years or so, my jazz collection has grown and grown and grown. But it's something that, you know, getting into it on vinyl, I think having that experience of listening to the full album that you get with vinyl, just yeah. sitting down, yeah. making an event out of it, yeah. is something that also kind of helped me get into it. But it's very likely that I would not have taken the time um, to get into as many other genres of music as I have since I started collecting vinyl. Right there in that regard, like that front to back thing. And then also going back to earlier in the conversation, Eric, with you bringing up education or, or me resonating with the word education. We as individuals, I don't, this, I can't speak for the industry, right? Like that's not what the point of this is, but it, it really, really frustrates me as a broadcaster knowing that, um, the a lot of these musicians jazz blues uh quote unquote the classics these artists have passed and um the the royalty structure the payment structure towards those musicians families they're nowhere near what they need to be for quote unquote sustainability uh for equity and this medium though because of the dollar it demands and because of the profit margin uh, for the label, for the artist that it gets, there's an opportunity where the industry itself um, can demand that artists are are paid for these things. If we, if we as individuals and all of our fans and all of and all of ourselves, me being a fan of all of you and vice versa, and you know, um, if if we're gaining something from that front to back, listen. Um, then that deeper thought process that will happen and it doesn't have to happen at your first listen it doesn't have to happen at your a, a thousandth listen but the process of being able to do that um ritually uh inspires deeper thought within self where questions just arise like i don't remember the first time that i was like hey can like when it, the first time like a needle uh you know, stopped working and I didn't know what was wrong with my music. I didn't know it was the needle. Like, what, what's wrong? Why can't I hear the music right? I had to figure out like, oh, look at all that dust on there. I remember that. I mean, I mean, like, I didn't even think about it. Like, holy cow, I should probably get that dust off there. That, that doesn't look good, you know? And, but that is the type of, um, internal education and internal um thought that this type of stuff evokes and it's powerful and it, and it creates change and so thinking like from where that like oh my gosh why doesn't this sound good and cleaning that you know 65 pounds of dust off of the cartridge for the first time ever that in itself i think is just so wildly important and addictive that um we need to that search that thirst 
uh, for for higher learning um, is is just directly connected to the medium. It's the closest you can get to seeing. You can touch them. You can touch. You right. can touch people's sound. I mean, let's be honest. Nobody in the digital age remembers the first time they downloaded an album. You know, no one remembers the first time. You know, they they opened their iPhone. You know, and streamed. You know, Beyonce or Drake. You know, it, it's like I mean, I, I remember. Um, U2's The Joshua Tree came out on my birthday in 1987. And, and I remember sitting in the locker room in high school and we were huge U2 fans because like we, we, we'd already seen them play during like the uh, um, Unforgettable Fire Tour. And, and we saw them play a few years, I think, earlier with the War Tour. And I remember my friends were like, oh, who's going to get it? Like, who's going to be the first one who's going to like walk in the rain to Sam the Wrecker Man, like three miles from our high school to get a copy of Joshua Tree. And because, you know, it was my birthday and I'm a schmuck, you know, I said, oh, I'll go get it. So I walked in the rain for like 40 minutes to the corner of Young and St. Clair in Toronto to walk into a satellite store of Sand the Rector Man. And I was knocking on the door like, let me in, let me in. And it was like, and I saw like the, the vinyl copy of Joshua Tree sitting in the rack and it could have been a hundred bucks. I still would have bought it. And it was like, it was so meaningful to walk out of the rain, soaking wet, like drenched like a little rat, and like take the record off the shelf and flip it over and see that really cool photo of, of Bono and the Edge and Adam Clayton and Larry Mullen Jr. in California in front of you know the Joshua Tree in California. I mean, I mean, I couldn't wait to go home. It was like I remember carrying the bag like under my under my arm and wanted to sand the record. I'm sure Eric knows what I'm talking about. And uh, Jeremy probably even seen the bag and walking home in the rain and going up to my bedroom and like, you know, putting on like the first side of the Joshua tree. And I think the first track is where the streets have no name. Like, I think that's the opening track on the album. Mm -hmm. and, and when that those opening notes to that song came out um, uh, in terms of my stereo. Cause at the time I was an audiophile back in high school. I had a really decent stereo when I was like 16, 17 and hearing that it was like, Oh my God. Like I thought my head was going to explode. I was like, Oh my God, you two, you two just became the Beatles of my generation. And, and it would, and it was kind of like, I have never felt that way since in regard to iTunes in regard to Spotify. I mean, no offense to my friends, our friends in the industry at Cobas and Tot and Tidal, but I don't wake up in the morning and take my cell phone, take and you know, take my Vakukta iPhone and be like, oh, I can't wait to stream the new album from uh, you know Brian Eno. No, it's not the same thing at all. Buffalo had a tradition that when the records were released, the record stores were open at 12.01 till 1 a.m. And we lined up. And nobody's going to line up for streaming. And I really <laughs> hope post COVID they open up that tradition again. Got there at about maybe 1030 for Acton Baby. When Acton Baby came out, um, we waited in line for it. And you got there. And, and if if you got there at 12 or 1130, you, you almost were guaranteed a physical copy. There wasn't streaming to fall back on. You right. had to get a physical copy. And Buffalo had a bunch of record stores that used to do it. And it was a fan fantastic tradition. It was great to hang out with your friends. It was great to either sneak out if you were too young or to give one of your older brothers money and they were going there. But 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 that's something special. So that it, it's similar to when I uh, went to the local mall and got Backstreet Boys Millennium on CD. <laughs> yes. Very I similar. I going to get that on cassette the day it came out. It was a totally huge... Bitch. I missed yep. that. That's exactly the same thing. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly the same. Wow. <laughs> Big day. I think everybody has kind of hit on two key points. It's community and connection. And that's what the vinyl industry and the vinyl phenomenon has kind of re-emerged lately in how people connect with music, how they discover music, how it becomes more meaningful to them. Those are really the keys. And I think what Ian talked about in the very beginning about how the record store has to evolve and become more of a place of community where you can discover people 
I mean, where you can meet people, where you can discover new music, where you can hear live music. When that comes back in a post-COVID era, that's what I'd really like to look forward to and building that and extending the communities that everyone's built on social media. It's phenomenal what Lauren at The Record Lady has been able to do and Jeremy at Budget Audiophiler has been able to do on Instagram and Eric at Audio Love YYC has been able to do. It, it's just amazing to watch your platforms grow and how you've been able to connect with this community in a way even a website as old as acoustics hasn't been able to do and that's what's that's what's um it's inspiring for me to be able to see this community build up and to be able to have you a part of acoustics i'm grateful for all of you and like i'm learning from you guys which is which is also reinvigorating me reconnecting me to music and that's what it's all about is like how do we how do we become more connected to music if i think back to the beginning of acoustics.com in 1999 vinyl wasn't even on the radar home theater was the big surge of that time where people were were transitioning out of two channel audio and two channel was considered to be dead and when I say two channel, that's um, that's kind of synonymous with vinyl playback and even CD playback. That's how people listen to music. And then when CDs came on, um, that was claimed to be perfect sound forever. And apparently the the claim didn't quite live up or the expectation didn't live up to the claim. You don't say. And. <laughs> and so it, when you when you combine all that home theater has is still going strong today but it never overtook stereo playback it never surpassed it there's just that connection to the music that home theater never quite got to so through that we saw the evolution of digital downloads and free music napster that whole era when music essentially became free, it became meaningless in a way that maybe in the very beginning, it was like, wow, I can have anything I want. It was kind of cool. But then it quickly wore off. Like I had 500 CDs. Suddenly I didn't want them anymore. So what do I do with them? So it's like everyone gave away, the, everyone gave away their CDs. They gave away their records. And... Over a course of time, what do we do next? Now that we have no physical music to hold on to, I think that's what that's what kind of led to the beginning of what about this old medium vinyl? Can we still use it? Is it good? And let's see what it can offer. And I think I think that being able to touch it, all of the all of the topics we've already talked about are so pertinent. And yeah, it's just been, it's just been great to see this and people are, people are more connected to music when they listen on vinyl. Like that's the bottom line to this whole conversation. It creates, it creates more meaning, creates more connection and it creates more community. And when you have those three things, you have a sustainable medium. Vinyl is so important. As, as both a medium, but also as a part of, I guess, culture, because it has enabled millions of people who had nothing in common, find some form of common bond. And, 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 and as we all kind of discovered over the last 13 months, isolation really sucks. And for most human beings, being stuck in their home and unable to interact with people is a very unhealthy you know, mode of behavior. And, and the fact that we've been able to spend the last hour plus talking about all the reasons why we have such a deep connection to vinyl and music kind of says to me that it actually has a lot more value than we ever really envisioned. You've been listening to the Acoustics Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe and comment. 
The Acoustics Podcast is produced by Mitch Anderson of Black Circle Studios. Original music by The Ark of All. Voiceover provided by Todd Harrell of SSP Unlimited. As always, get up-to-the-minute news and product reviews at www.acoustics.com. Until next time, keep listening and stay high five.